So what are we doing today? We're going to um, apply what we've learned with gravitational field theory to orbits. And specifically, we're going to solve problems involving orbital period, and we'll look at exactly what that means, and orbital speed. And we'll try and relate these relationships to satellite use and what that's all about. Some of those concepts are high level, but they're definitely worth introducing now because they're actually quite interesting. So orbiting satellites, which have used for a myriad of purposes, come in two general types. So there are geostationary satellites and polar satellites. So it's um, important that you're clear on the difference between those two. Geostationary satellites are always above the same point um, or same position of the planet. So as the Earth is turning, as it's rotating, the orbit of the satellite is such that it has the same period of rotation, right? So if the Earth takes 24 hours to spin around, the satellite also takes 24 hours to spin around. And that way it's always above the same position each time. Okay, so it's always above the same point. Now that's really important if you want to use that satellite to constantly uh, reflect a signal to the same position. We'll look at late, um, uses later. The second type of orbit is a polar orbit. And this involves the satellite going from pole to pole as the Earth is turning. You can see that here. Now, the satellite can position can be controlled. And what's nice about this is you can pretty much position that satellite anywhere above the planet. So right now, I want you to go over Spain. You just position it. You get your timing right so that you can stop just above Spain as it spins below you. Or you can move it down and wait for South Africa to come along um, or Australia or you can stay in the middle and um, you know hover above New York. Okay, so this allows a lot more flexibility. What I'd like you guys to do is to research as to the uses of satellites and why this kind of orbit, which orbit would be most relevant. But we'll look at that in a, in a minute. The next thing we're going to do is look at these relationships. Now, we're going to be doing a couple of proofs, and for that we need to go back to circular motion. Um, in circular motion, one of the relationships that we derived was this idea of force equals mass times acceleration. But acceleration in circular motion, if you remember, was linear speed v squared over r. And then from circular motion, you should remember that the linear velocity of an, a satellite or any object that's moving in circular motion is 2 pi r which is the circumference over the period t. So if you put these together, laughing because uh, a six-year-old was having a massive tantrum in the other room, um, it's over now. So let's put these two relationships together and we have um, force equals mass times v squared, um, which would then give us two squared, which is four pi squared, r squared over t squared and it gives us this relationship here this monstrous relationship but this can be very very useful in circular motion and also in gravitational fields so it's important to bear in mind this proof now let's take it one step further let's actually have a look at circular motion um gravitational fields sorry let's have a look at the relationships that we've got in gravitational fields the first one from circular motion is that F equals mv squared over r. F equals mv squared over r. And also force, the force towards the centre, if we're considering an object that's moving around in a, a circular path around a planet, that force is towards the centre and it's a gravitational force, isn't it? It's the gravitational force between the two masses, the mass of the satellite and the mass of the planet. So it's equal to G, the gravitational constant, 
the two masses over r squared are being the same as r here, the radius of, so, of, of that motion. So you can put those two relationships together. mv squared over r equals gmm over r squared. And that gives us a last relationship. If we now rearrange this, cancel the r's, and then um, put your other m over here, we find that this m cancels, one of these r's cancels, and you end up with a relationship between velocity and the radius. And in fact, these two, this connection is very, very important because the radius of, a, of an orbit has a direct influence on the velocity of the satellite or the object that's moving around in that orbit and the other way around. Now I'm going to give you another relationship which is monstrous <laughs> but also very useful. If we go back to this idea, this new relationship for uh, velocity that we have, v squared or the speed of the object in the orbit here equals g m over r, right? But then we go back to circular motion. What was v squared again? Well, v was equal to 2 pi r over t. So v squared is 2 pi r squared over t, which is equal to g m over r, right? Now, if we uh, rearrange that, if we multiply out these brackets and then rearrange it in terms of r and t squared, you end up with r cubed over t squared equals gm 4 pi squared. This is something called Kepler's law. It's not actually on the syllabus, but on high level papers, they throw this proof in. So it's important that you understand what I've just done um, and eventually learn it off by heart. Okay, so this now gives you a direct relationship between the gravitational um, properties and the period of rotational orbit. Okay, so that's pretty much it. There'll be a task which I will outline um, in the lesson and in the classroom assignment. But basically, we're going to start working with satellites. And I'd like you to use the information on this presentation to do some calculations for real satellites that actually exist.